preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rabbi Paul Joseph. I'm Associate Director of Humanities for Jewish Education, and this is the 92nd Street Y, and you are at Dalton School. This is the first part of a three-part program, which is entitled inquisitively, Freud, Marx, Herzl, Nearsighted Visions of Redemption. Uh, for a reminder, those of you who uh, in, in, attend uh, all of the parts of the program, the next two weeks of the program will be uh, back home at the 92nd Street Y. Uh, because of a complication in our scheduling, we uh, needed to make these special arrangements for tonight, but I hope you're comfortable. Uh, Marx, Herzl, and Freud. These are uh, majestic names in the history of ideas. There's probably no common denominator <clears throat> that would link them together logically, except insofar as each was a person of tremendous originality in this thinking and had a kind of self-sacrificial determination to see the theories realized on the social scene. Each of these ideas, when presented, were thought of as having the potential for transforming society and possibly transforming the very nature of the human being. And uh, people changed the way in which they comprehended the world and in which they spoke about the world in the light of the ideas put forth and the vocabularies provided to us by these thinkers. These men each inspired full-scale movements uh, to implement their theories and to, and to, as it were, propagate the faith. With varying degrees of success over the intervening years since their origin, they have had thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, rally to their causes. And within that rallying, there was always, we believe, a significant Jewish investment of commitment. And this uh, series asks the question, one, why that should be, did Jews have a significant role, not only as it were as original thinkers, but as major players? And then in the meantime, what has happened since the heyday of these movements, insofar as those original dreams were realized or not fulfilled, or even if there was no fault in the theory, what has changed in the nature of, per of people uh, such that uh, today perhaps these movements don't enjoy the same support that they once did? Tonight's presentation on Freud, the founding father of psychoanalysis. Upon his death, just a, a little more than 50 years ago at this very season of the year, psychoanalysis had reached its apogee of worldwide appreciation and acceptance. It purported to be an all-embracing worldview, and it, its application took it into well, very far off areas from its original use uh, in the treatment of personal neuroses. It affected social theory, history, art, law, religion, literature, on and on it goes. W.H. Auden, uh, the, on the occasion of Freud's death, said, to us he is no more a person now, but a whole climate of opinion. To tell us more about this uh, special founding father, we're pleased to present tonight Dr. Dennis B. Klein. Dr. Klein is the director of the International Center for Holocaust Studies, which is an educational and research program under the auspices of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. Uh, Dr. Klein directs a program of uh, scholarship and research and of education, uh, literally, that uh, is uh, worldwide in its, uh, in its outreach. His academic and re research expertise is chiefly devoted to the area of modern European intellectual, social, and cultural history. As noted in your programs, he is also the author of The Jewish, Orig Jewish Origins of the Psychoanalytic Movement, originally published by Prager in 1981 and cited as a best academic book of the year, and has recently uh, was reprinted in paperback by the University of Chicago Press. He's done numerous studies of Austro-German society during the era in which Freud lived in that part of the world, as well as uh, given us insight into Freud's relationship with that very special Viennese Jewish community. I'd like you to welcome Dr. Dennis Klein. Thank you. 
Thank you, Paul. Actually, you have a better view of the audience from up here than you do from down there. I was, didn't have any idea who was. Maybe that's just as well. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and to present uh, to you some thinking that I have done really over the course of some 10 plus years on this topic. And I think the reason why it's always been such an interesting challenge and why I think this series is such an interesting challenge is to try to disentangle a bit the kind of universal impulses of our movements that we're looking at, and that includes Zionism, from the clear, as I will show in the case of psychoanalysis, uh, Jewish uh, involvement in these movements. And this is, you know, always a troubling kind of a relationship. We hope that each one of us in our own activities brings something to the larger world and yet retains our own identities and individualities. And this is partly the, the problem that I look at in the case of psychoanalysis. It's also, I might suggest, the chief problematic of modern European Jewish history. And I hope to have an opportunity to give some background for you to this specific movement of psychoanalysis, but to keep in mind, if you could, that there is constantly running throughout the life and culture of modern European Jewish history, that is to say, from the Enlightenment or the late 18th century to the Holocaust, a, on the one hand, desire to become part of that larger society, to assimilate, to use that term, uh, with, of course, emancipation coming to the Jews at the end of the 18th century, on the one hand. And on the other hand, this struggle among Jews, certainly, to retain their own Jewish identities and individualities. And to somehow reconcile the two has really always been a, a chief um, uh, and disquieting relationship for the modern Jewish history. So then I'll turn more specifically to psychoanalysis, keeping these two polarities in mind. To begin with, and I always like to start with a few facts to familiarize yourselves to our problem, while not going into so much the theory of psychoanalysis, in fact, my concern is really more with the movement of psychoanalysis, let me then uh, turn to some information that may not be generally known. Until 1906, that's about four years after Freud formed the circle of analysts, all the members of the movement, without exception, were Jewish. And it's really that fact, I have to recall, that uh, motivated my own research and thinking and inquiry about this subject. And there is nothing, as we know, more universal than a theory that studies human behavior and human thought. And the emphasis on the human, on the general, is so clear throughout the writings of psychoanalysis. And yet, uh, here we have this fact, and what do we do with that fact, that every member until Carl Jung joined the movement in 1907, was Jewish. And to supply a little bit more information, and here I call on the analysts themselves, there is a very famous, I think a very important letter that was published in 1908 by Freud to his colleague in Berlin, Karl Abraham. And in that letter, Freud expresses a fear or the danger of psychoanalysis becoming what he called a Jewish national affair. Now, of course, Freud wanted to move beyond that, and by this time, Carl Jung was in the movement, so was Ernest Jones, Freud's biographer by this point, uh, and a clear desire on his part, we can see again from the letters, to make this a truly international movement. And by that, it wasn't only to 
invite, encourage, et cetera, non-Jews into the movement, but non-Viennese, because again, they were all from Vienna, all in Vienna, where this movement, which was to become so universal and international, took place. In response to that letter, Abraham writes back that um, he nonetheless has always found in Freud's thinking some Abraham's words, Talmudic qualities to the theory of psychoanalysis. There are other examples where we can sense in spite of themselves a strong Jewish allegiance or attachment to psychoanalysis or within the movement of psychoanalysis. And here I'll mention a few names and you won't really recognize them or I doubt that you will uh, because the early circle really was made up of uh, basically second-rate figures. Carl Jung being of course an important exception. But one, Victor Tausk, in the teens wrote uh, that psychoanalysis, uh, he felt, was a creation by Jews, and moreover that Jews were the only ones who could create a movement like psychoanalysis. Others, is it or Sadger, in the early circle, not great thinkers, Edward Hitchman, Oscar Rie, I mentioned these names to you to bring out some of these, uh, the names behind that figure of 17. Fritz Vittles, who I'll talk a little bit about, and Otto Rank, who I think might qualify as a first-rate thinker, but just not well known. All attributed to Judaism, to Jewishness, is probably a closer term for this, something special special creative talents and perhaps the reason in their thinking for the success or the importance of this movement of psychoanalysis. On the other hand, there was, and this in a sense affirms some of this evidence, a fear, um, a mistrust of those who were not Jewish, who were gradually entering the movement of psychoanalysis, in particular Ernest Jones. Where, and Freud expresses this, he felt, and again his term, a racial strangeness. Racial. You see, racism, and again, as some of this history I think is important, and maybe we'll have some time to bring it out, was of course very potent, especially in Vienna, and especially at this time. And racial anti-Semitism in particular. But Jews being a part of that culture adopted and adapted racism as a creed or as a way of thinking. There truly was a racial worldview that we know erupted in the 1930s, but there are seeds of this already before the First World War. Though I think Freud meant something different from what, say, a non-Jew might mean by race, nonetheless, that's his term, that he felt a racial, very distinctive distance between himself as a Jew and non-Jews. And of course, it created some tensions, and we can see this in Ernest Jones' memoir, Free Associations, which was published in 1959, where Jones was quite open about his disappointment and his resentment for the early analysts, all Jews, because they felt some, his term, moral superiority over non-Jews, over himself. And that kind of tension obviously concerned him. He was onto something else, but for our purposes, it clarifies somewhat, certainly emphasizes this sense of Jewish, a Jewish bond in psychoanalysis. Now, I think we, or some of us, I suspect, are aware that this evidence, this self-acknowledgement, which somewhat coincidentally for Freud ended around 1908, was a source of embarrassment 
later on when some of this evidence was dug up because, again, Freud wanted so much, so badly, to create an international universal movement. And those who were in his shadow and who enjoyed the success of psychoanalysis in later years were, too, somewhat concerned that the evidence of a jo strong Jewish tie might interfere with, again, this international idea of psychoanalysis. And so again, I turn a little bit to Ernest Jones in some interesting history that he wrote in the 1950s, the famous biography of Sigmund Freud, three volumes, where we now know Jones suppressed some evidence in reciting the letters of Sigmund Freud and creating, recreating his life and time. When Freud, and we get this evidence from letters published after the biography, when Freud referred to some gratitude he felt towards those of his faith, we find in Jones's version a deletion, an omission Without the, what you would expect, elliptical marks, those three dots, that would at least give us a sense that he's leaving something out, and therefore gave the impression that Freud felt little of this. And that's, of course, exactly what Jones was trying to advocate, that there wasn't any parochial ties, or certainly nothing parochial about psychoanalysis, and the loyalty within the movement as it grew, as it became successful and international, led to a kind of a suppression of this kind of evidence. I remember when I was doing a little bit of my own research in Vienna, going as I certainly had to, to the Jewish, to the Freud Museum, and asking the director of the museum a little bit about, do you have some documents on this? Is there anything that I should know, et cetera, et cetera? and his being somewhat uh, strong, that you won't find it. It's not there. You, you're really on the wrong track. Um, the movement of psychoanalysis insists that there should be no acknowledgment, certainly, and there's no significance even, significant, significance, even if there was, of a Jewish tie. On the other hand, in this attempt to understand, to interpret the Jewishness within psychoanalysis, there have been those, we know too well, all too well, who overestimated, who magnified the Jewishness within the psychoanalytic movement and within Freud's own thinking in particular. And of course here I'm referring to the uh, Nazi movement where it pegged uh, psychoanalysis as a Jewish science and on that basis would destroy the psychoanalytic publishing house in Vienna and in, in, uh, in, uh, virtually dismantle the entire movement. It's interesting that even some admirers of Freud saw almost too much within this um, impulse that was an attempt to praise Freud but probably interfered with a true understanding of what that relationship was. There was one very interesting scholar from the 1920s, Roback, A.A. A. Roback in 1929, believed that the theory of psychoanalysis, in particular introspection, its emphasis on introspection, on realism, the emphasis on the concrete, were all a Jewish bent of mind, his observation. And he would use the term, was evidence of some racial thinking, Jewish racial thinking within psychoanalysis. Now here he thought that was terrific, but uh, whether you admire psychoanalysis or whether you oppose psychoanalysis, there were those who felt that there was more to this, I think, 
than there really was. This balance that I referred to at the beginning between the particular and the universal is a hard thing to fathom. And I've given you some history of the debate and the extremes that have taken place, denying it on the one hand, or I think overestimating it on the other. The truth uh, is, um, I think, an important thing to see, to understand. But before I even give some evidence beyond what I mentioned before of this very, very uh, enthusiastic Jewish attachment of the analysts, I think I need to make clear, if it isn't already, from the writings of psychoanalysis, that there was certainly no attachment to the religion of Judaism. And we do know that Freud himself was very much opposed to the Jewish orthodoxy of his then fiance, Martha Bernays, in the 1880s. We get this from the letters not approving, in fact, very strongly discouraging her keeping of the fast on Yom Kippur, of the Shabbos, etc., and writes, you know, in his publications and say the future of an illusion in 1927, that the belief, say, in God was really nothing more than a helpless and extreme clinging to authority. He wrote a piece earlier in 1907 called Obsessive Actions and Religious Practices, where he, in a sense, re reduces religious ritual practice to a neurosis. There were others, Freud included, who not only opposed or rejected Judaism as a religion, but opposed as well what they call the unassimilated in Vienna. And by that, they referred in particular to Jews in East Europe, Jews who were increasingly migrating to the capitals, Berlin, Vienna, and Paris at the turn of the century. And there's some very strong, now published letters that show how much the analysts try to separate themselves from that unassimilated East European Jewry to put themselves in a plane that they consider was cultivated and higher. I think this um, strong anti, there is an anti-Jewishness then that complicates this somewhat further, is most clearly seen in some of the facts here that will clarify the point. Two of the members, at least two of the members of the early circle, Alfred Adler and Otto Rank, in fact converted Rank uh, to Catholicism, Adler to becoming a Protestant, and uh, Vittles, and apparently there's some evidence that Freud too considered a conversion at one point or another in their lives. And so that complicates us somewhat. What do we mean then by, or what was it that Freud and others meant by a Jewish attachment? And there isn't much left. Peter Gay constantly reminds his readers that there isn't much left. What are we talking about then? If they regarded themselves as Jews, wasn't that only nominal, just a label? Did it have any real meaning or substance? Gay and I incidentally carry some of this debate out openly. And uh, he uh, acknowledges some significance, unlike Jones, but he dismisses it as significant. But I take a quote from Freud himself that leads us into then some further evidence of the importance and the insignificance of their Jewishness. Freud at one point said about his Jewishness that there was enough that remained to make the attraction to Judaism and to Jews so irresistible. And the question is then what was that for him and for those who followed him that was so irresistible about being Jewish? And here I'll begin with the manuscript, and some of this has yet to be published. This one by Otto Rank, called The Essence of Judaism, that he wrote in 1905. It came literally on the verge of his joining the circle, 
as if, of his having such a great admiration for Freud, and in particular the Interpretation of Dreams, published in 1900. And in that essay, and it is not published, but it is so revealing, Frank makes a astonishing statement about being Jewish or what being Jewish meant to him. He begins the essay, some three pages, by claiming, by stating that Jews are outsiders, that they have had a long history of discrimination and persecution. They just moved out of the ghetto literally, but not in reality. And it seemed to him that that was something that the anti-Semites, those who rejected Jews, and very strongly, as I stated, preferred to see Jews as those who were pariahs in German society. But for Ronk, rather than being a stigma, it was an advantage. Because as he observed, and so many others, why would I want to be a part of this society, of Viennese society, in which factionalism was rife? That is to say, conflicts, not only between Jews and non-Jews, but for those who have that familiarity with the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the nationalism that was also taking place at the time, that was tearing apart, polarizing, this culture, this community. There seemed to have been no center left except for the empire, the concept of the empire itself, which Jews, by the way, supported. So much strife, so much tension, that to be an outsider, according to Ronk, was favorable. That favored him. He has something now on those who seem to be caught up in a destructive internecine quarrel. In addition, he would then further state that not being part of a civilized morality, he then, as a Jew, and for all Jews, had a special relationship to what he called nature. Nature is an important concept in psychoanalysis. It might be another term for the unconscious. And there, all the analysts found something rich and something energizing about the unconscious. For Jews to have that relationship to that, what he called in this essay, nature, was something quite special. Historically moving on in his thinking and in his essay, because Jews, more recently in their history, resisted their natural endowment because they so much sought to be a part of German society to assimilate, we're in a very peculiar situation that, again, created an historical moment for him, for Jews, at the time. That moment was a strong desire, based on their nature, to resist assimilation, to oppose anti-Semitism, or factionalism, or the civilized world, so-called, and as a result, bring to the world something that only Jews were at that time capable of bringing to that world. And the term redemption is used for the series or for this particular lecture, and that's precisely the word that applies. It was an apocalypse for, for Ronk that Jews were apocalyptic. They were in a crusade, as Jews now, in a crusade to redeem the world. And again, under the spell of Freud, he would then bring in some of his psychoanalytic new thinking and call it a cure that Jews could provide for the neurosis of mankind. What is so revealing about the document is that he brought into a circle, entirely Jewish at the time, and self-consciously Jewish, a feeling that Jews could engineer social change through psychoanalysis. 
And I think the evidence becomes fairly clear in a document like that. But it also becomes clear and confirmed by other early publications by the analysts. One more example and before I turn to Freud. And this is the example of Fritz Wittels, who wrote a manifesto of sorts himself. This one was published, though not translated. And it's called Der Taufjude. It's a book he published in 1904. This is some three years before he joined the movement. Der Taufjude in English means the convert Jew. And here we see a little bit of his thinking with regard to his own Jewishness. Similar to Rang, and quite eccentric, there's no question about it. He argued, very similarly to Rang, that Jews were outside the mainstream, an advantage, and he therefore could declare something that Jews could offer to provide, to present to the world at large. It was more of a declaration than a careful argument uh, to make a similar point that Ronk made. But what's interesting in this book are the terms that we're looking for here. He believed that Jews not only had an opportunity, but yearned for final redemption. I think even the word final is so significant here. There is an apocalyptic way of thinking. Or that Jews should become in a, involved in a struggle for justice and to make that their life purpose. And so like Ronk, he too finds some revolutionary significance for Jews. And I will turn to Freud to yet make another case for this, another argument for just the way they were thinking, let alone those who interpreted them later on, the way they were thinking about their Jewishness. And what I find so important and significant is that this polarity between the particular and the universal, in fact, for the analysts, were symbiotic. There was nothing that diverged in their thinking between the particular, between the parochial, and something that, again, was larger and worldly and assimilated. I mean, after all, they were all assimilated Jews. But Jews, they were. And they acknowledged it and saw its importance. Now, in Freud, unfortunately, we don't have any single document that works out some of his thinking. There are references in, the, in his letters, but no document that works it out the way Ronk and Vittles did. But Freud did become a part of a very significant society, of a very significant organization, significant for him. In 1897, and this is really at the very root of the psychoanalytic theory, he joined a group called, it's here in this country as well, but with a very different purpose, the B'nai B'rith, the B'nai B'rith Wien, it was called Vienna. In Europe, it was designed as a social gathering for Jews, so very necessary for them because of anti-Semitism, because of the ostracism that so many Jews felt at the time. The rejection of Jews that Freud felt in the universities. He believed that he could not get that full title that meant so much to him of being a professor because Jews were being rejected from the highest ranks in the professoriate. So for Freud and for so many within that society, it was a source of some social consolation. Freud was very active in this circle. He attended just about every me meeting for some five years, from, 19, from 1897 to 1902, just at the birth of the psychoanalytic circle and movement itself. Incidentally, I get this information from the minutes of the B'nai B'rith Society at the time. <clears throat> 
evidence, incidentally and importantly, that Jones didn't suppress but dismissed as some kind of social, outside social activity and nothing more important than that. Freud was also very active in some of the society, uh, some of the committees within Veen, B'nai Veen, and especially important, he was active in a committee that was responsible for establishing a second B'nai Lodge in Vienna called Eintracht in 1903. And we know that Freud was responsible for bringing into Eintracht two members who were eventually to join him in the psychoanalytic movement, Eduard Hitchman and Oscar Rie. In addition to that, Freud presents to the B'nai B'rith some eight lectures on psychoanalysis. It was his only forum for presenting these earliest ideas of psychoanalysis. Some of this Freud himself uh, censored later on in his life, referring to this period as a period of what he called splendid isolation. It was more painful to him than that. But it wasn't a completely isolation either. There was this circle, and it was important, and it was important to his thinking because they were receptive, and one can therefore argue they encouraged some of his thinking, provided some kind of, a, of an audience for him, some discussion. These were not professionals. Nonetheless, enough, sufficient, it appears, for Freud at this time. And he does refer from time to time to how grateful he was that there were this, this body, at least, for him. An argument can be made, of course, I do make the argument myself, that the B'nai B'rith coming as it did, again, just before the formation of the circle, serving as a form for his ideas, attracting figures who he would later associate in the psychoanalytic movement, could therefore serve in our thinking as an embryo of the psychoanalytic circle itself. For Freud, the evidence can't be as clearly delineated. He didn't say it the way Ronk did or the way Vittles did. But I don't think it requires too much, especially within the context that I've laid out, too much of an, of an imagination to see just how important the circle was for the movement he was eventually to form and for which he would move away, from which he would move away eventually by 1908 seeing a danger in this Jewishness and rejecting it, and not referring to it much after that point. A great deal of evidence, I think, but what are we to make of it? Well, it is somewhat nominal, this Jewishness. There really wasn't much substance in it for them. But they attributed importance to it, and I think that's the key thing. From our point of view, not much there. From their point of view, it was crucial. They felt some confidence, some self-confidence. They interpreted their Jewishness and being outsiders in such a positive way, in such an important way of giving themselves a sense of, of, uh, of creativity, of a revolutionary kind, the term that Tausk used. And whether or not it was true, and whether or not there's much to it beyond that, as Gay would say, I think that it, in fact, lent movement to psychoanalysis. I think this is what embodied the movement. Feeling Jewish, being Jewish, nothing more than that, but important enough. Became the engine for the analysts. So that psychoanalysis was more than just a circle of scientists studying an important question. They had a sense of a crusade. You read in Vittel's writings, in reference to his past, that he saw within psychoanalysis a mission to, in Ronk's term, cure the world of a neurosis. And from that, from, from their Judaism, this, they derive that sense of a crusade. Thank you. I get a cup of water, that's... Yes, absolutely.
I couldn't have completely bombed. Right. Well, uh, one of the nice things about uh, these kinds of programs is that it gives us an opportunity to reflect on what our speaker has had to say and also to bring some of our own personal concerns or interests to a dialogue. Um, one of the reasons I enjoy hosting a program like this is I get the privilege of asking the first questions. Um, and um, so I, I had thought of some things originally, and I, I'm, I'm not a historian, uh, but I do have an interest in this particular period of history. And I, I asked uh, Dennis uh, the, this evening uh, over dinner before the program how he happened to bring these two things together, one, his interest in history, and second, this obvious interest in psychoanalysis and the history of the movement. And um, he reflected on the idea that um, for history to be more meaningful than just a, a journal of facts, uh, one has to go below the, the obvious sur surface level, and one needs an apparatus, a hermeneutic, by which to do that. And uh, so he brought those two things together. Am I saying it Yeah, correctly? I wish I said that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's great. No, you did, you did, you did say that. Uh, I, I was thinking about, um, uh, you know, we think of the leadership of the movement as gravitating toward Freud and seeing a... Uh, uh, an image there that they could relate to. And I wonder um, how many Jews, uh, because uh, of the, the experiencing a similar kind of status in their own life situation, that is to say, uh, even though they're emancipated, they're basically alienated from the host society. Um, Freud was uh, deprived uh, by emancipated, free-thinking parents of any real significant attachment to his Jewish roots. So in a sense, he was marginal to both cultures. He was living on the edge. Um, and instead of uh, seeing it as a weakness, uh, as it were, he made a virtue out of uh, a necessity and saw this as, a, as a, a freeing up of himself to do really original and, and powerful creative things. Uh, is that a fair assessment? No, they all saw, exactly, they all saw, uh, not only Freud, but they all saw themselves as living... Uh, into, I guess Kafka had a phrase for it, of having uh, two feet rooted in some uh, traditional society and two feet out of that into something else, and always somewhere in between, feeling, as you were saying, on the edge. And for some, you know, that was very dispiriting. Uh, when this anti-Semitism made it so clear to Jews that emancipation was really a fiction, mm -hmm. uh, I would say for the most part, Jews throughout Europe redoubled their assimilationism. And they tried so hard to prove, and here the word prove we find so much in their writings, to prove their worth as good Germans. Um, uh, almost, uh, in a sense, denying the reality of the time, believing that anti-Semitism was not native to Austria, for example, that it was an import from Germany or from France or from Russia. Mm. Uh, so for the most part, I should you know, make it clear that this was a great uh, period of anxiety for most Jews. Stephen Zweig, in his reminiscence from this period, would refer to a great deal of anxiety that European Jews felt, but still clinging to that more remote hope. The Jews I've talked about, and incidentally Herzl, and this will be discussed in your series, is another uh, Viennese Jew, who felt, uh, who thought the same way as Freud and others, had a different interpretation. Maybe they felt the need to have that interpretation. I'm not too sure why they uh, insisted that, no, we cannot continue to speak better German than the Germans themselves, but that instead, no, let's back up and see what we have and do something with that. Uh, hard to figure out why you know one went that uh, direction and, and uh, other most other Jews went the other direction, but Herzl himself had a concept just two years before he wrote the Jewish state in 1895, uh, proposing to the Pope that, yes, I'll lead all these Jews to the Stephans Dome in Vienna to lead them to uh, conversion. Hmm. I, I'll do that. You know, I can be this great figure, as he always thought of himself. Two years later, he writes the manifesto to the Zionist movement mm -hmm. in Herzl, the thinking, so very close in this period of time. Mm -hmm. 
there was a real identity search going on here as, as the, the freedom left them without anything solid to, uh, to define themselves by. I, as a, as a, you said before about we can speak better German, I've heard it said, is it apocryphal, that, uh, that Freud was considered for a Nobel Prize, but in literature. Right. Uh, because of the quality of his use of the German language and so forth in his writing. That's quite right. He won the prize, the Goethe Prize, in 1930 for civilization and his discontents. I suppose a terrific thing, uh, but it wasn't anywhere near what he was hoping for. And you're right in psychoanalysis because he wanted to, you know, uh, with his kind of medical scientific background and training, he felt science, and of course that's another great movement for this time and our time. Science was truth. Literature is entertainment. Mm. Mm. So yes, it was very important to make psychoanalytic theory and thinking scientific, and hence the prize he would yearn for was in science, right. for sure. Mm -hmm. One more privilege. Uh, I can't help but think of, um, of how, in one way or another, um, this dream was realized insofar as psychoanalysis became a a tool that as i indicated in my introduction found application in virtually every area of intellectual culture's expression whether it was in aesthetic theory or whether it was in political theory or obviously changed many uh, notions of the psychology of man and, and things of this sort um psychoanalysis changed, uh, let's say, some of the uh, uh, foundations of, of Greco-Roman thought, of uh, the Christian model of man, uh, of the soul-body dichotomy, uh, of the intellect and free will as the measures of personhood and so forth. Uh, to what extent, let's play psycholo psychologist for a moment, is psychoanalysis almost an assault on the culture of the Gentiles? an assault on Western civilization insofar as it calls all of its pretensions to having depicted reality in a certain way for so many thousands of years, and now this Jew rises up and says, you're all mistaken, you've missed you know, the most important part of yeah. all these years. Well, certainly the Nazis themselves, I mean, it's precisely uh, their attitude towards Freud, uh, who would be obsessed with sex and say so, I mean, mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And um, yeah, and they saw it as the uh, kind of the science of the gutter. There's no question about it that you're know, taking us away from our culture of our you know higher uh, refined thinking and saw psychoanalysis. Yes, you're quite right, uh, certainly for them, as this assault on their lives, mm -hmm. on their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And a kind of, a, you know, in a sense of an impurity, a contamination, all the racial thinking that we now know about the way Nazis thought about Jews. I don't want to uh, hog this, so I see a hand up over here, the lady on the aisle. Yeah, no, I meant to say that it was the name is A. A. Roback, who was teaching at Harvard in the 1920s. And uh, no, not at all anti Semitic. In fact, he was a great admirer of Freud's. But his admiration for Freud was really not so much even for the theory, but for evidence of just how rich and creative the Jewish mind is. I don't know if it was necessarily a defensive. A piece of uh, literature he was writing, uh, I think he just honestly felt that Jews had something to offer, and this was evidence for that and promoted to psychoanalysis on that basis. But I think it's an interesting kind of to show that the Nazis didn't monopolize his way of thinking, that uh, racial thinking was in the air for Jews and for non Jews. And he did say that psychoanalysis was an example of, a symptom of uh, racial, uh, Jewish racial thinking. Uh, that's the point. I was making there. Mm -hmm. Yes, down in front. <clears throat> you said something earlier, which I caught part of, that it's in connection with, I believe, another person who talked about the idea of the father figure in religion as being appropriated by human mind, human psyche, because of 
sort of this way, the need of the Balcali figure, Barbara Cannon, who is there something that you said about that? And did Freud ever address this question of why did you need to have a God figure in connection with the dependent child? Oh, All right. uh, could yeah. you summarize the question for the benefit of folks in the back in the event they weren't able to hear? You're going to give me the privilege of doing it. <laughs> You're the moderator. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, better if you rephrase the question because then you'll answer that. Oh, one. I see. Yeah, rephrase it the way I can answer it. That's, that is clever. Uh, yes, your, your point was, um, is there in Freud's writing this uh, emphasis on uh, helplessness, as he would say it, on authority figures. Uh, the example I gave in the lecture on uh, in, in God itself has the extreme uh, authority in our lives. And it is, of course, that's exactly what Freud's uh, uh, theoretical, if you want, uh, underpinning to his thinking that we are, as people, um, often torn by impulses and by things that are beyond our control, whether it is unconsciousness and its uh, uh, need for sexual gratification and even destructive impulses, or whether it's a superego or the ego ideal, which would become, can become very repressive, oppressive, uh, making it impossible, immobilizing. A functioning human being. And of course, his great hope, his desire was then to carve out a room for what he called the ego or rational control, where we can master our own fates. Uh, so that to be dependent, to be believers, without unthinking believers in God, to him, was just an example, as far as he could see, an important one certainly, of uh, our uh, mankind's uh, helplessness and not, therefore, exerting what they are so capable of doing, some kind of rational a rational course in their lives. Incidentally, and I might have come out a little bit by way of this lecture, many of his followers, and the two I spent some time with tonight, uh, Otto Ronk and uh, Fritz Fiddles, had a very different way of looking at this. They were always attractive to Freud's idea of the unconscious, but their therapy, or solution, cure, was not to strengthen, to fortify the ego, but rather, and this is so clear in Ronk's thinking, it's, it's really quite uh, engaging to read him, rather to unleash all the uh, creative energies of the unconscious, all of them, that uh, the ego itself, and Ronk would say this in his debate with Freud in writing, uh, the ego itself was, could be, was, reason, was uh, somewhat repressive. Uh, and you have some very uh, important uh, debating going on and strong differences. And more than that, you have, of course, this mentor-disciple relationship here going on. So more than that, they were trying to, yes, accept Freud, but to break away from Freud at the same time, which I think is a very fascinating part of this period of time in psychoanalysis. And uh, yes, you would have Frank uh, continue to argue, no, not reason, but on the contrary. But since becoming a disciple was more important for Frank at this time, he would emphasize, like Freud, the importance of an unconscious and giving that some liberation. By the time Frank, you know, matured, by the time of the mid-1920s, when he finally broke away from Freud, he wrote this outrageous book called The Trauma of Birth, where he just revises uh, the libido theory entirely along the lines that I more or less have laid out. So you have that kind of uh, debate going on within the movement itself. And you see, therefore, that Ronk and Vittles, and Vittles had a similar way of thinking about this problem, would be so adamant and so declarative about Jews being the engine of redemption. Freud could never quite go that far. I and mean, that's one reason I think that we don't actually see a statement by him on this subject. He can never quite go that far. And there was some restraint as far as he was concerned. Jews have a role to play, an important role to play for him, but historical, really. It didn't mean that Jews would become this source of destiny for all mankind, but would be a kind of a nurturing, embryonic kind of thing for psychoanalysis for himself. And he acknowledged it. 
but to move away from, to move beyond. So uh, even there you have some differences. Mm -hmm. Yes, the so question straight back. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Uh, this came, the evidence for this at least, comes in the 1880s. And it comes precisely around his courtship, four-year courtship of Martha Bernays. And I think he was really, in a sense, uh, reacting to her orthodoxy, which was a form of reacting to his own parents' orthodoxy. He did have, his parents were exposed to um, Hasidism and other occurrence in East Europe. They both came from East Europe, his uh, Jacob and uh, Amelia Freud, and his, uh, his uh, parents. So he was reacting to that through Martha. It's somewhat complicated, but the reaction of, to that was a form of defiance more than anything else. That you're going to, uh, you see, cling to this or to, uh, you know, adhere to that. Uh, I'll go into a different direction. It really wasn't, I don't think, anything more than that. He dropped the whole subject. He never, of course, converted. Uh, but there's other things that indicate his moving somewhat into that world, if not the religious world. Um, Freud changed his name, not well-known, first name, from uh, his birth, uh, not the Hebrew name, the German name, uh, Sigismund, to Sigmund. And he made a deliberate conscious change there in the, I think, the 1870s. Because Sigismund was the name of a king in Poland in the 16th century, I believe, who, according to his father, hence naming Freud after him, was well revered by the Jews of that time for his policy of toleration for Polish Jewry. Freud, a little bit, you know, obviously, again, uncomfortable with that inheritance wanted to move away from that. And what did he move to? But it was natural, Sigmund, but not coincidental, a very Germanic sounding name. So his assimilation was somewhat along religious lines, not taken seriously, more seriously, was towards German, becoming part of the German society at a very intense period of assimilation along at this time. It was a part of a German fraternal society at the University of Vienna in the 1870s, which espoused all these German national ideas, folkish ideas. Freud was part of this, broke away from it, and was stung by its turn into anti-Semitism as a source of anti-Semitism. And that was a great period of painfulness for him. But, you know, we have that for an evidence of a strong, strong desire to reject that Judaism to reject his Jewish inheritance and to become fully, as much as possible, fully German. But keeping in mind that before it became anti-Semitic nationalism, German represented for Jews throughout the 19th century something progressive, something humanitarian. It was the Reichstadt, the state of, uh, that stood for justice and for enlightenment that to appeal so greatly, of course, to Jews at this time, that to see this as not national, but as more than that, as humanitarian, was his great attraction. And in a sense, he transferred some of that desire for a cadre from Germanism, folkism, to folkish causes, to what he then became uh, defined as some being Jewish. To what extent might we see um, <clears throat> his uh, last work, Moses and Monotheism, as a playing out of, of that same tearing conflict within himself? Yeah, there's no question that that's the great work, the one that uh, he probably had in him for so many, many years. Uh, Freud had a long uh, identity with Moses. Uh, one historian traces it back into the early 1890s, but we also have evidence in an essay he wrote in 1914 called The Moses of Michelangelo, 
and then of course Moses and monotheism. And for him, the identity was so strong that it, it does seem to appear in his dreams as well, as he wrote about that. Moses was a prophetic and a visionary figure, and Freud always saw himself that way, and therefore found in Moses some, some kind of a, of a way to, to make that real for him. Of course, the uh, work you're referring to, Paul, is a very, very difficult work, and has you know it's it's there's so much in that that it's difficult to arrive at common conclusions. But yes, it's not the traditional Moses that he is, of course, uh, uh, elaborating on. It's a very peculiar ethical Moses that he was trying to revive coming in the 1930s of course it was a very sensitive tract and, and somewhat with strong anti-jewish sentiment in it so it's it's an important work but it comes out of that history for, for those who are not familiar with it the uh, one of the theses of the work is that moses was not a hebrew but was a, an egyptian prince who uh, usurped the leadership of the hebrew tribes and attempted to impose a a new alien, uh, little-known elite Egyptian religious way of thought on this unruly horde of Hebrews who subsequently killed him and then spent the rest of their history atoning. It's a rather far-fetched theory and uh, doesn't have any credence at all in scholarly circles, but it says a great deal about the author of it and what conflicts he was working out within himself. Right. Down front, Ms. Leon, yeah. You know, such an intriguing, uh, and scholars, you know, devote grants and uh, what few remain and their uh, time to finding this connection. It's, it's, it's such a tempting one. To begin with, Herzl lived only two streets away from Freud. He lived on a street called Trickgasse and just, you know, down the block. It's Bergasse. Uh, so my gosh, there must have been somewhere, you know, on the University of Vienna kind of, you know, for those who know Vienna, comes out from those two streets. And so, you know, somehow they must have had that interaction. There is nothing, or as far as I'm aware of, uh, the very least, very little in Herzl's reference to Freud. There is one reference uh, in Freud, a letter I believe it is, to Herzl. But it's a significant one. Uh, Freud referred to Herzl as a great leader of our people for humanitarian causes. One at the time certainly would not associate Herzl with humanitarian cause, but rather, of course, with the Zionist cause. Uh, I find it intriguing to see what so many other Jews like Freud thought of Herzl at the time. And on the one hand, they reject Herzl because Schnitzler, Arthur Schnitzler for one, rejected his, uh, uh, Herzl, I'm getting all these names confused, uh, very, very explicitly because Herzl seemed to play out just what these assimilated Jews could not, and that is to form their own state in isolation from the rest of this world. Uh, on the other hand, and it is also there in Schnitzler and in others who are writing at the time, they had some not-so-hidden admiration for him because Herzl, and I think even more than anyone you can find in the psychoanalytic movement, seemed to be able to articulate just what assimilated Jews were looking for, and that was something about their self-reliance as Jews the sense of self-determination, which is to say that assimilation, which Jews embraced, was by that time, and very explicitly in this uh, book, Der Taufjuda, a morally bankrupt policy. You cannot, Biddle said, depend on the Reichstadt any longer because we've seen what it has become. What's the alternative? 
On the one hand, this you know, intensified assimilationism. On the other hand, what Herzl said so beautifully, we can do it ourselves. And what is not well known about Herzl, I assume it will become known in the course of this series. Can I plug this series enough for you? Thanks very much. Uh, what is not as well known is that in the Jewish state, that manif the Zionist Manifesto of 1895, when he begins Herzl to describe Zion, he describes it in perfectly liberal assimilationist terms. In fact, Herzl said Hebrew will not be spoken here, that Yiddish was a jargon and therefore must not be spoken here. And then, in fact, we should feel perfectly free to speak our native tongue and to espouse all those great ideals that they somehow couldn't find in Europe, which was toleration. We'll be a tolerant people at last, and people will, we hope, it tolerate us. But Herzl went one step beyond that. He said that Zion would become a model state, a model, if you will, liberal state, we may have to do it ourselves. That's the key for him. We'll create this model liberal state and we'll show the world what this dream of liberalism will really look like. And I find that such a revealing uh, uh, manifesto when looked at in those terms, and I'm not the one to interpret it that way. In fact, I lean on Carl Shorsky for this. Um, that, uh, but is such a, what's the term here? It's almost an icon of the period that Herzl said it better than anyone else. We Jews can do it ourselves, but what are we doing? We're going to achieve that dream of assimilation ourselves, do it ourselves. Uh, it's a very important tract. Yes, please. Um, in the 1920s, there was a, a figure called Siegfried Bernfeld, who I believe did have these uh, strong ties. I don't know if it was orthodoxy, but the religion. And um, footnote, why not? Siegfried, Siegfried Bernfeld was the designated biographer of Freud when he died in the 30s, late 30s. Uh, we can imagine what a completely different history of psychoanalysis would have been, certainly the Jewish part of that. Uh, but uh, he was then neglected or passed over partly because of honor Freud's per, uh, purposes and uh, Jones was selected. But I think Bernfeld is one. Carl Abraham, uh, because of those Talmudic qualities, that kind of, the phrase that I mentioned before. It's a good, I mean, it's a good point, and I, you know, obviously it deserves some, I don't think it was orthodox, though, but there might have been more of an attachment there than, especially because of that phrasing that he uses, that he seemed to be inclined toward it. But religion, as a as as a frame of mind, was so um, attack under attack at this time within the psychoanalytic cir circle. The minutes of the psychoanalytic movement certainly make that clear. It'd be hard to see how certainly before the war, anybody could still favor the movement and still remain religious. And how they would reconcile that would be intriguing. I don't know how he would have done it, but perhaps after the war there might have been some of that. Uh, Richard Rubenstein uh, has written a fascinating uh, work called The Religious Imagination in which he uh, <clears throat> attempts to show uh, an interesting harmony or, or uh, parallel between the uh, classical Talmudic rabbinic notion of man's psychodynamics, words which the rabbis never used, uh, and uh, Freudian psychology of man. I made a few notes about it, uh, but the rabbis divided man into a creature with two opposing tendencies, the Yetzer HaTov, the good inclination, and the Yetzer HaRa. Uh, and presumably in this we have uh, the healthy, healthy ego uh, bedded by a healthy superego operating against the libidinal savagery of, of the id and so forth. And uh, the goal of a healthy existence is to serve God 
b'chol levavacha, with all one's heart, and this means to bring both the evil impulse into co coordination or harmony mm -hmm. with the good impulse, which is actually a forerunner of sublimation. Uh, and there are many stories in the Talmud about uh, how when, when you take that evil impulse away from the world, people no longer get married, build buildings, or create progeny, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how essential the evil inclination in is proper service is. So yeah. I was wondered if that was why, again, Jews could resonate to this portrait of man that uh, Freud put forward. Well, there is a book written, in fact, the first one on the subject, uh, written by David Bakken in the 1950s, 1956, where he, um, uh, you know, argues that Jewish mysticism provided the model of psychoanalytic theory, uh, somewhat along the lines here, and uh, it's intriguing to find the parallels. But I'm always a little bit, in fact, one of the reasons I, I think I got involved in this so much I was somewhat um, not uh, enchanted with this form of intellectual history where uh, parallel thinking would suffice as an argument for inf the influence of one on the other. And, and back in not being a historian, I mean, the training is somewhat different here, would, would not therefore work that part out, but I was dissatisfied with it. And I felt um, the importance of providing as much evidence as we possibly have, if that's true. I finally came to a conclusion that uh, it was, it's almost impossible to make a, for me at any rate, uh, a conclusive case, uh, though there are those who have tried, if with some success, uh, between the Judaism and the theory of psychoanalysis. And I let, left that for those who, who would try that. Uh, and there's been a number of uh, very tantalizing attempts. John Cudahy, one. Martha Robert, another. And um, therefore, uh, focus on the quality of movement, or bewegung, the word that they used at the time. Not circle. It wasn't a Christ. It was a bewegung, and that intrigued me as well, so I focused my time on that. Mm -hmm. Any uh, speculation as to uh, what happened? Um, is this a nearsighted vision of redemption? Um, has the movement run out of steam? Did history pass it by, or did uh, uh, did it cease to be an effective metaphor for describing human action and motivation? Or what 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 do you have to offer us on that? In particular, the Jewish part of this, or yeah, would would we say that psychoanalysis is uh, certainly there's still an international psychoanalytic movement? In fact, if I'm not mistaken, psychoanalysis is quite alive and well in Europe and uh, South America and, and other places, uh, not faring too well here in the United States anymore. But um, is it still a Jewish phenomenon? Mm -hmm. And uh, if not, uh, why did it pass us by or we pass it by? Well, I hate to answer it in terms that are not quite as direct as you might be hoping for, but I think the reason for that, in the case of psychoanalysis, it might be a little bit easier in fact, it would be easier in the case of Marxism and Zionism. But in the case of psychoanalysis, the significant, and you, and you did in fact introduce the, the evening tonight quite uh, correctly, in the case of psychoanalysis, its real contribution is less, or let's say its real legacy, is less in the field of psychotherapy as it uh, is in the fields of literary criticism. I mean, it is almost impossible today to write a biography without some psychological, psychoanalytic uh, feeling. I mean, it's not theory, but the, but the whole sense of a dynamic of the rational and the irrational and juggling with each other and the irrational ultimately so powerful and this played out in, in the novel and the fiction and in biography, so powerful. I mean, it really is a way of thinking that Freud defined. That's why it's so compelling. But the problem now for you with this, for your answer, Paul, is that uh, it in, psychoanal psychoanalytic thinking insinuates itself into such broader streams of thinking that it's hard to dissect from the from biographies, from literature, the debt to psychoanalysis in particular. I mean, it's become a way of thinking. <laughs> 
So then even further to define why are Jews, you know, attracted to this, it's, I think, a hard thing to really mm -hmm. determine. Um, more strictly in Europe, the psychoanalytic movement, I honestly don't know whether more Jews than not are attracted to it, but let's face it, uh, there are fewer Jews uh, to begin with. So I would say uh, one can make a, uh, one would have a hard time making that kind of a case. Mm -hmm. It is nearsighted. So am I, but that's something else. <laughs> yes, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I like that question too, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't just uh, narrow it to religion. There was a very active, strong women's mov movement throughout Europe at this time, and uh, they really had the same sense that women uh, excluded from society, from the privileges of society, not really given their enfranchisement. Uh, would of course feel the stigma of that, um, but like some Jews uh, in Vienna at the time, throughout Europe, but really in particular in Vienna, uh, would feel that some would feel that 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 is just uh, that's just so so important that we have something then to offer as women, because we've been outside of society. No one else has an advantage the way we have in in proffering something that the world itself might not already have. The world is so patriarchal. The world is so masculine. It's so muscular. You know, there are wars or there's premonition of war. And uh, women would say that uh, what we can offer is, is some, some, some leavening in this world. Uh, and, and love, and peacefulness, um, uh, some um, um, organic relationship to each each other and not as men prefer their autonomy and their um, uh, tendency to dominate and so you have in this in the in writing of many women at the time okay I mean it's, it's I think the answer to your question is not in, unless you have an, uh, in mind a particular religion I can say that there are these streams not only within Judaism but within other categories of uh, social categories. Also, wouldn't wouldn't it be true that, um, insofar as other religions that uh, have had a a world saving notion about them, there was a basic uh, there was an imperialistic or triumphalist nature, namely one could bring about the salvation of the world if everybody would join up in the dominant movement. Whereas this was, in a sense, a counterculture movement. That's right. You know. no, that's exactly right. I mean, one uh, well. It's true, but only as a. It's true, but only as if you want part of the creative process. You see, it creates some problems. Obviously, uh, Freud would hesitate. I'm sure he did uh, when he read a, a document. If he learned about a document by a Robach, Robach, because the implications, especially when Robach uses the term racial thinking, the implications is that Jews have no non-Jews haven't a chance to fully understand. Psychoanalysis is the last thing he wanted. On the other hand, uh, Freud, uh, during this earlier time, which is very important, but very different from what he became, he uh, shared with Abraham that he wondered, as Jung entered the movement, whether a non-Jew could fully grasp psychoanalysis. It, it's, an, it's a curious thing. Um, and... Uh, that, and these are some of these great letters to Abraham, uh, he felt that someone like Abraham, because he was Jewish, might be really more able to understand psychoanalysis than Jung would. He rejected that whole thing, but it's just how powerful that way of thinking is an example of that. Um, yeah, I mean, Freud would want to pull away from that. Did that answer your question? 
Yeah. That was a question. That was a question I had uh, when I was defending my thesis. Never a um, a, a great moment. Uh, I didn't answer it too well then. It was. It's a great question, and I don't think I can still answer it for some reason. I do have a problem whether that Jews kn sensed or believed that only Jews. It wasn't just by coin. What if they were all Catholic? Could they then have said Catholicism would become the source of mankind's salvation? Uh, I, I guess how can you prove it, or how can I mean that's one of the problems, I guess, with the question. I mean, what's what's the counter evidence for that? Uh, there were, of course, uh, pockets of creativity in this great period for Viennese history. Uh, which attracted did not attract Jews. The Secession, for example, the uh, avant-garde, um, the Art Nouveau movement, the artistic movement in Vienna, attracted uh, uh, Gustav Klimt and others, uh, did not seem to attract Jews. And it would be interesting to study just to kind of work some of this thinking out, whether they had another kind of feeling. They drew on something else that, uh, for Freud and, and those around him, um, was similar to their Jewishness. That would be an interesting study. I'd like to suggest a thesis on this, which uh, I may, or may add or, de or detract. Um, but it's been pointed out by many different uh, uh, students uh, of uh, what was biblical thought, Hebraic thought, uh, that the Jews were the ones to pull the original reversal in the mythologies of most ancient people, uh, the perfect time was in the beginning. It was the, 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 the time in which everything was well and the world has been running downhill ever since. Um, the Jews reversed this myth and that the perfect time was put at the end time, at the end of future, and that history was a process of working toward mm. that time of expectation. And in the light of the teachings of the Hebrew prophets, man or human beings, the Jews in particular in, in their society, had a specific role to play to rehabilitate themselves in order to bring about God's kingdom here on earth. Uh, whereas in the Christian reworking of that myth, it would take an act of divine intervention from outside that was unearned and was a gratuitous act of divine love to bring it about. So if you're asking me, and not Dr. Klein, I would say yes, that's a very specifically Jewish idea, and I don't know of any culture where that idea exists where it's not derivative from Judaism. Gentleman right behind that gentleman. Would help it to become accepted eventually? That Freud's rejection in Vienna led to his idea of internationalizing the movement. Well, write the book and I'll, I'll take a look at it. No, um, but, yeah. I, uh, I just, again, I have to turn it around just slightly, because there's something to what you're saying, I think. Um, but again, it's within there's this way of thinking about their own Jewishness. I do think, and many Jews at this time acknowledged, that if it weren't for anti-Semitism, assimilation would have continued quite uh, fully to the extent that Freud had taken it himself before anti-Semitism, which was an embracement of Ger German, German nationalism, and, how, and a real hostility for Jewish culture. Um, so uh, I suppose anti-Semitism provided a little grist for them to work against uh, and to uh, create something new and different. Uh, that, that much I think I can say. His rejection in Vienna at large, it's true. Um, well, evidence for this is interesting. When he presented a lecture on hypnosis 
in the late 1880s, after coming back from Paris, he was lucky enough to have a grant, um, he, um, he presented the results to something called the Society of Physicians. It was a society, it was a real distinguished society, maybe uh, on the same par as the AMA or something. I mean, it was really the, the prestigious medical research society of the time, and he was invited to give some, some of the results. He was a rising student. And uh, so he so I talked about this uh, theory that Charcot in, in uh, Paris had developed that was somewhat outrageous and hysteria and, and similar kinds of thinking in, in, in popular uh, in, in Paris at the time, and was not well accepted, or so he said. It's hard to know exactly his reception, uh, but he believed that he was rejected. Now, that's, that may well be, but how did he report that rejection? And I think it was to Wilhelm Fleiss, a close confidant in his letters at that time. He uh, put it in these terms, that he was rejected by a Christian society um, which gave him further belief that Christian Vienna wasn't ready for anything really new and that therefore uh, he would have to derive, he didn't put it quite explicitly, but I think that there's these connections that can be drawn out that he would have to look to something opposed to Christianity, to Judaism, Jewishness to offer something, the only chance for anything that could be new, that's, that stands a chance for anything novel. Now, again, that he imposes this construct on a, an event, the event being a rejection of him, and the construct being Christian versus Jewish, is what's so significant here. It's almost as if he needed to create an opposition and to define it in terms that made it possible for him to arise and go beyond it. And this is just how he did it. And this was as early as 1889. It's very fragmentary, this kind of evidence at this time. It becomes far more compelling by the time he joins the B'nai B'rith in 1897, almost 10 years later. Um, but that's what he needed. That's what he was looking for. And I don't know if this is true about Vienna in general, but that's how he saw Vienna as Christian Vienna. We'll take one more question. Uh, someone who hasn't asked before? Yes, this lady back here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a great question too. It's you have um yeah, Paul and I were talking about this beforehand. You do have during this period in the 19th century and straight through and we hope discredited by national socialism uh this ideological impulse. I don't know if it's religious necessarily it kind of leads to the same thing. It's this vision of perfection, perfection on earth. And um, we certainly know, by example, unfortunately, that that could lead to uh, a, a genocide. So uh, it, it would be far more difficult to embrace that, though it does happen, uh, to believe that there is this kind of apocalypse still possible. Um, but what can therefore psychoanalysis offer? Well, I think that I've overstated somewhat the case of Freud's psychoanalytic theories. Because Freud was, and we should remember, in fact, very pessimistic about his world. Uh, he carried into this movement so much enthusiasm, and it caught on with his followers. And I have to add here that there's a generational distinction. Freud was a father figure 
um, literally to an Otto Ronk and to a Fritz Vittles. Uh, Ronk was 18 years younger than Freud. So that, you know, Freud is something like about 40 years old, and you have a young guy coming into the movement and looking to Freud very clearly as a father figure for him, for Ronk. So you have a generational distinction, this youthfulness, uh, this youthful kind of enthusiasm that Ronk and Vittles articulated was apocalyptic. But Freud, though there is something in there, I, th I think that it's true that he had this kind of forward-looking view of the world, nonetheless was restrained far more than they were by a uh, more sophisticated, subtle, mature appreciation of just how intransigent the world really, really is. And therefore, he had some doubts about his own, whether his own theory could provide a therapy of sorts. He is, is the therapeutic dimension of psychoanalysis in Freud's writing is far less interesting and, and far less worked out than his devising a way for us to understand the world. And for Freud, the result of psychoanalysis should be nothing more and can be nothing more than analytic understanding. Understand, where does this come from? Where does this destructiveness in us come from? For Freud, that was the question that could be answered, may not be answered, but that was sufficient as a question. It's a terrific question for him. He wanted to know what were the motivations? Uh, how do we explain our world? And beyond that, whether the world can be saved was not a question that he addressed. It really wasn't. He did not feel, and of course, if you read Civilization and its discontents, we know this, that Freud had no, no, none of this. Uh, so I think, in fact, you can go, go right back to the sources, they say, and uh, for your question, and to see that psychoanalysis offers us tremendous, a tremendous grasp of our very volatile period of time to understand that. I was talking to Paul. One can't write a history of the 20th century without some psychological insight, my belief. But I think there's something to it. The world is not stable the way it might have once been. It is too volatile. It is too destructive. It is, there is too much violence in our time. We know that. How do you understand that? How do you make sense out of that? How can you not ignore that? Uh, so uh, you see, psychology or psychoanalysis provides that piece of understanding. And that, I think, is as far as we need to take it. Certainly, that's what Freud believed. So metaphors uh, and visions of, of reality serve in their time and become a way for people to interpret and make sense out of a world that is altogether too often chaotic. And um, sometimes reality intrudes overly much, and uh, the metaphors don't quite have the vitality they once did. We'll look at um, some other visions of reality and prospects of redemption in the coming weeks. Uh, next week at 8.15 at Buttonweiser Hall at the 92nd Street Y, uh, Professor Harvey Clare of Emory University. Uh, Professor Clare is a uh, leading authority on especially the phenomenon of the American Communist Movement and will tell us about the special role that Jews had to play in the heyday of the American Communist Movement and even on into uh, contemporary times. And then the week after that, we're pleased to bring uh, one of the uh, great fathers of the American Zionist movement and great teachers of the movement, uh, Ben Halpern, down from Brandeis University. And he will be with us. Um, that will be October the 31st. So I look forward to uh, seeing you back with us in the weeks to come. And thanks very much for being here tonight. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.